preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. Today we are beginning the second lecture of the Jacob Wolf series on science in the modern world. Many of you, I know, were here last Tuesday and heard Mr. Gerard Peel speak on the impact of growing technology on economic and sociological factors in our growing and hopefully not completely decadent civilization. Next Tuesday, we shall hear a lecture by Professor Devins, who's chairman of the Department of Physics at Columbia University on physics. And today, we will have the pleasure of hearing my good friend and colleague, Professor Katz, on mathematics, and in particular, on the universality of mathematical concepts. Now, in discussing this aspect of mathematics, he will call to your attention applications in the field of number theory, topology, physics, all of which in one sense or another you will define. And finally, on the subject of marriage laws in primitive societies, which perhaps in this day and age require no definition. Now, I want to make my introduction as brief as possible to give as much time as possible to Professor Katz, who is a much more interesting speaker than I could be, at least on this occasion. And I will tell you in the rest of my remarks who he is, I've told you now briefly what his subject will be, and I will mention three names in context which you will gather. The first is the name of Josiah Willard Gibbs, who was one of my great heroes when I was a graduate student at MIT many years ago. Willard Gibbs was one of the great scientists, one of the greatest scientists of the 19th century. He lived most of his life in New Haven, a member of the faculty at Yale, and he was responsible for contributions of a major kind to mathematics and aspects of mathematical applications. One considered perhaps not too important is his work on vector analysis resulting in a well-known book by one of his students Professor E. B. Wilson, who, by the way, was one of the professors of Mr. Wolf, who's in the audience, who's responsible for arranging these lectures. Uh, the other contribution of Gibbs, and many people, chemists in particular, think that this was his greatest one, was on the application and the integration of thermodynamics with chemistry. I happen to be a chemist and a physical chemist, but I believe that uh, at least equal in importance to that contribution was his monumental work in statistical mechanics. Gibbs was not a man of many words. He wrote beautifully, and incidentally, and many chemists don't know this, when he first came to Yale, he taught the classics, not science. Actually, there is no great difference between them except in, in attitudes and in objectives. On one occasion, and I'm told one of the two occasions at which he said anything at a faculty meeting, he was asked by a colleague, what do you mean by mathematics? What is mathematics? And he said, mathematics is a language. Mathematics is a language, 
It is the universal language of science. It is the purest and most carefully detailed language. And in its pure form, it comes, I believe, nearer than any of the sciences to poetry. But, and here you will permit a little modern slang, if you can read that language, you can read lots of things into it. And if you dig that language, you can dig tremendous wealth out of it. So much for my statement about mathematics. The examples will be presented to you by Professor Katz. Secondly, I want to say a word about mathematicians. What is a mathematician? Well, the late Professor Norbert Wiener, who was a good friend of Professor Katz and a good friend of mine, was once asked about a mathematician. How much mathematics does this mathematician know? And he very impatiently said, this is completely irrelevant. A mathematician is a person, like an artist, who can use tools as he needs them, and where they are not adequate, he can make his own. And he said, incidentally, there are two kinds, those that are all engine and those that are all brakes. Those that are all engine are dangerous, and those that are all brakes are dull. Professor Katz is both engine and brakes. Now, before I say any more about Professor Katz, and I have to say a few words, I want to tell you that he was born in Poland not many months before the First World War, that he obtained his doctorate at the University of Lwów with Professor Steinhaus, whom I had the pleasure of knowing when he visited the United States and was a guest at the Rockefeller University, then still known as the Rockefeller Institute. And on the occasion of his visit, I believe, his first visit to America, someone asked him, do you know Professor Katz? He said, know him? I invented him. So much for Gibbs and the definition, a kind of definition of mathematics, and Wiener, whom most of you know as the father of cybernetics, and uh, Steinhaus. Professor Katz is a very eminent mathematician. His field is mathematical analysis and uh, probability theory. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a member of our National Academy and the chairman of the Division of Mathematics of the Council. The National Council of the Academy. He is a member, of course, of a great summation of mathematical societies. He is a person which has a, who has a very catching enthusiasm, and I hope that you will be able to walk steadily out of your seats because he's a very exciting speaker. Professor Katz. Sedlowski, ladies and gentlemen, the trouble with introductions is that it's so terribly difficult to live up to them. And as a matter of fact, if I were to do one tenth of the things which Professor Sedlowski expects me to do, then I don't think we would be out of here in time, and I don't think you would be all that eager to continue with your mathematical studies or what have you. Now, the title and the theme of the series of lectures is Science in the Modern World. 
By the way, all three terms are not entirely well defined. Nobody knows what science is, or at least I don't. It is very difficult to say what the world is, and God knows nobody knows what modern is. However, for better or for worse, it does convey a meaning, and I think more or less there is a consensus, if you'll pardon me, the use of this perhaps not entirely popular word these days. Mathematics occupies a unique position, as a matter of fact, not only among sciences, because actually some mathematicians would resent calling mathematics a science, but among all human disciplines, because it is both an art and its pursuit for its own internal beauty and elegance, though some of you perhaps thinking back to your unfortunate experiences with your fifth grade teacher who tortured you with long division may perhaps not entirely agree with adjectives of elegant or beautiful. And it is also a servant and a very useful servant of many other disciplines. And as a matter of fact, it is this dichotomy, this peculiar dual heritage that both produced the progress and the tensions. And as a matter of fact, if one may be so bold as to suggest, there is no progress without tension. Now, the aspects between the pursuit of the beautiful, of the pure, of the artistic, and at the same time, the interest in the mundane and the pragmatic have not always lived happily under the same roof. And in fact, I would like to read you one of my favorite quotations, because though referring to events which took place about 2,000 years ago, are remarkably applicable today. It is in fact a quotation taken from the life of Marcellus, from Plutarch's lives, and I quote, Plutarch I mean, Eudaxus and Archytas had been the first originators of this far-famed and highly prized art of mechanics, which they employed as an elegant illustration of geometrical truth and as means of sustaining experimentally the satisfaction of senses, conclusions too intricate for proof by words and diagrams. As for example, to solve the problem so often required in constructing geometrical figures, given the two extremes to find the two mean lines of proportion, both these mathematicians had recourse to the aid of instruments, adapting to their purpose certain curves and sections of lines. But what with Plato's indignation at it and his invectives against it as mere corruption and annihilation of the one good in geometry, which was thus shamefully turning its back upon the unembodied objects of pure intelligence to recur to sensation and to ask help not to be obtained without base supervision and deprivation from matter. So it was that mechanics came to be separate from geometry and repudiated and neglected by philosophers took its place as a military art. Well, tonight, rather than to preach a sermon on this theme, which in fact I could, and which in fact I have done in the past, I thought of taking you, with your permission, and hopefully with your attention, through a corner of mathematics, which can be explained, I think, perhaps not fully, but more or less so, so as to show you the two aspects of mathematics, and ultimately to come back toward the end of my lecture to the theme which I set for this lecture, namely to the universality of mathematical concepts and the sense in which mathematical concepts can be considered as universal. Now, I'm going to ask your indulgence because I'm going to ask you to think a little bit. It is tiring, I think and it's already very kind of you to have foregone a pleasant March evening to have come here to listen to a lecture on the universality of mathematical concepts. But if any good is to come of it, it will be much better if we also, now that I have you 
captured, so to speak, to try to also ask you to, to bear with me. And while perhaps not everything will be entirely clear to you, not because of my excellent exposition, but because some of the things are perhaps a little bit difficult, I think you will, if you bear with me, I think you will catch the glimpse of what the whole thing is all about. There'll be very, very little of what many of you will remember as mathematics from your high school or grammar school, or even university days. If I will use numbers, it'll simply be because they're easier to write on the blackboard than letters. And consequently, there'll be almost no calculations except at one point, mainly for a historical reference, and just so that I will not be held responsible for my colleagues, and a few of them are present here, for not telling the whole truth. Let me start with an extraordinarily simple concept which everybody is familiar, with, with which everybody is familiar, namely of a set of objects and with transformations. Now, by the way, I do not want to bring into this house the terrible shadows of new math. This, I'm not going to be hysterical about sets. I'm simply, a set is what you think a set is, a collection of objects, and that's for the time being will suffice. Because there are going to be only finite sets, in fact, very few of them will have more than six or seven elements, we'll simply write them as numbers. But if you prefer to write them as letters, so be it. There's, if I write one, two, three, and four, and you prefer A, B, C, and D, that is your privilege and nothing will change. But now, given such a set of objects, and let me write them as one, two, and three, I can now perform one of the simplest transformations that can be performed on such a set is to change the order. So for instance, I could exchange two and one and leave three alone. So I will write one, two, and three as a reminder forever of the, or of the original order, and underneath I will say what I have done. I have now transformed, because I transformed one into two, and two into one, and left three alone. Well, three perhaps might feel slightly insulted by this thing, so I could have tried another one. I could have done something like this, in which case, actually, everyone has, has been subjected to a to a non-trivial, you might say, transformation. One into three, two into one, three into two. Such an operation, such a transformation is called a permutation, and it simply is changing of an order. Now, there are six permutations of three objects, including the one which is no permutation at all, namely, it says don't do nothing, or, do, or, or don't do anything, if you want better, better, better grammar. And as a matter of fact, on the very first slide, I'm going to show them to you all because I'm going to do a little bit of manipulation with them. May I have the first slide and may we have the lights out? Here they are, and as a matter of fact, I, gave, I called them F0, F1, and you can just see F0 is a, that peculiar permutation which doesn't permute anything. One is left to be one, two is left to be two, three left two, and, and so forth. F1, F2, F3, F4, F5. And so because I started numbering from, from not, there are six of them. By the way, if I had four objects, there would have been 24. If I had five objects, there would have been 120. If there were six objects, there would have been 720. And already with five objects, I certainly could not have written. But all the ideas I'll, I'll try to explain to you will, will, ever, will never leave the uh, realm of three or four. Now, may I have the lights, please? Now, having defined for you such a transformation, I will define for you now how to compose them, how to perform two transformations one after another. Now, as a matter of fact, even in ordinary daily life, we perform certain transformations or operations, we compose them. For instance, one of them is putting on a shoe and the other is putting on a sock. And as a matter of fact, notice that the order in which you perform them do not lead to the same result. <laughs> if you don't believe me, try it. It's a simple experimental fact. Now let me see whether I can do the same, whether I can compose these permutations. So suppose I take one permutation, one, two, three, and let's say three, one, two, 
and then I'll write here one, two, three. See, I don't really have to write the top one, but just to remind you that the initial order was one, two, three, and then uh, we'll write it whatever it is. Two, let's say, one, and let's say three was here. Now, I want to compose these two. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, we are in the young, in the Young Men Hebrew Association, so it's only proper that we read from left to right. And in fact, that's exactly how, they, how these things are composed. And you see, this one, this one sends one into two, but then two is sent into one. So the final effect is one is sent into one, correct? You see, it simply tells you, do what this one says. Take one into two, and then go to this one, two into one, all right? Two, two is sent into one, but one is sent into three. So ultimately, two is sent into three, and then three is sent into three, and three is sent into two, and so you have this one. So you can write, you have now learned a new operation, and you, it's called composition. You can now compose permutations, and it's perfectly easy. You can even, on a dull Sunday afternoon, play it with your children. You can, you, you can do it because it tells you precisely what it is, how to do it, Take one into two, two into one, and then write down the result. Now, there are six of them, and any two can be combined this way, and you get something which looks like a multiplication table. Perhaps I shouldn't call it a multiplication table, but it is like a multiplication table, just to show you that it looks like one. My next slide will show it to you. Well, you see, remember F0, F1, F3, F4, F5 are permutations? If you laboriously, or perhaps, well, it's not really very difficult, uh, half an hour on a Sunday afternoon will do, you can easily work it out, but you don't really have to, you can believe me, and I will be glad to supply you with a copy of this slide to check you, and it says if, if F1 times, I mean, composed with F2 gives you F4, always, however, you must be careful to keep track of the order. If you change the order, for instance, somewhere F2 times F, F2 composed with F1 is F3. Always the F2, but F1 composed with F2 is F4, you can see. So it is a little bit like the sock and the shoe proposition. Now, may I have the lights, please? Why even, you might say it's amusing. You have certain objects, certain transformations, you can combine them together. And the remarkable thing is that whenever you combine them together, you always get one of the same kind. See, I'll never get out of the six I had. If I only keep combining them according to these rules, I'm going always to get one of the, of the, sa of the same set. It's a very, very important proposition. Then, as a matter of fact, there are some other rather interesting things. There is this permutation already, which I mentioned to you, which doesn't do anything. Whoops. This one doesn't do anything at all, and that's called the identity, or the neutral permutation. Eh, no four, goodness gracious me. You see? The other one did so many terrible things, it wasn't even a permutation. <laughs> now, if I have another one, for instance, one, two, three, three, one, two, then you can say, how would you undo it? How would you undo it, what I have done? Well, in this one, you, t you turn one into three. So to undo it, you would have to, to turn what? Three into one. Now, two turn into one, but... Uh, Two, two, in order to undo it, one would have to turn into two, and by the same token, whatever, whatever it is, two would have to go. Oh, yeah. Not quite right. Uh, two, one. <laughs> one into three, three into one, two into one, one into two, three into two, two, one, one, two, three. I guess, I guess this must be here and I have undone it. That is then called the inverse. And so you see, you can play a little game with these symbols. They are not exactly 
familiar to us, but they were introduced many years ago for a very interesting purpose. They were introduced by, well, actually, it goes back to Lagrange, but a little later by Galois and Abel, to work out a very curious problem of solubility of equations in terms of radicals. Now, all of you have heard of solving quadratic equations. And then ultimately, there's a formula. It's probably all of you have forgotten x squared plus ax plus b equals 0. Then it's minus a plus or minus a squared minus 4b or something of the sort. Nobody ever teaches you any more cubic equations because they are too difficult. Quartic equations are not taught either. And then here and there, you hear the remarkable rumor that for quintics and from there on, nobody can do anything, you see. Now, as a matter of fact, the fact that you can, can no longer have formulas in terms of operations which involve multiplication, squaring, and, and roots to solve equations above the fifth one is a, was a remarkable discovery that was, in fact, done by Galois and by Abel in the middle of the last century. And as a matter of fact, it was done precisely by consideration of such permutations. Let me take three minutes, because I, I can't give you not even an inkling into what is known as Galois theory, but at least I can tell you what the, roughly what the idea is, because the idea will recur later on in, in context, an entirely different context, namely with certain applications to physics and to chemistry. Now, they, if I may have the next slide, I will try to make, a, and that, now those of you who don't want to do such uh, can now rely, it's a footnote, as far as most of the readers are concerned. But you see, on the top I have written a cubic, x cubed plus a, ax squared plus, this t is a misprint, should be a plus, plus bx plus c, and of course if there are roots, everybody knows one can factor it into x minus x1, x minus x2, x minus x3. And then there are the famous formulas, which you can verify yourself, you can remember a little bit of algebra, minus a is the sum of the roots, b is this combination, and c is this combination. Now these combinations, x1, x2, x3, and x1, x2 plus x1, x3, and so forth, and x1, x2, x3, are very peculiar. Because no matter how you permute the indices, if you subject the indices to any of the six permutations, which I described to you, nothing changes. And an expression is called one valued or symmetric if no permutation applied to the indices of the axis can change its value. And you can see it's a little bit of experimentation, and in fact, on x1, x2, x3, it's obvious, and so it's obvious on x1 plus x2 plus x3. Good. Now, on the other hand, this expression I wrote right here, x1 minus x2, x1 minus x3, x2 minus x3, is already two valued because under certain permutations it remains the same. But for instance, if you change one into two and two into one and leave the others alone, then the sign will change and it's two valued. Now, also remarkably enough, the square of it remains, of course, one valued and as one knows very well, is expressible. I have written to you, that's a little more complicated to know what it is. Now, the remarkable thing is, that's a simple theorem, already I think Lagrange knew it, well over 100 years ago, that any function, any rational function, because as far as we're concerned, only rational operations and perhaps taking roots are concerned, are, we, we, we are, are allowed. So any rational, any rational function, which is two-valued, can be expressed in terms of simply one-valued functions and this delta. Now, known as, by the way, as the square root of discriminant. Now, this is a remarkable discovery, even though it's very simple, because from the fact that you know something about the symmetry of the expression, and listen to that very carefully, because I will come back to it, because you know how it changes under certain permutations, under certain symmetries, you can deduce something about the form of the expression. And indeed, one can then show, and that's immaterial really, that there is an expression like I've written right here whose cube happens to be two-valued, and if it's two-valued, it can be expressed in terms of this delta. If it's in terms of this delta, one can finally solve it. And then one can show by studying only the structure of these permutations 
only, only the structure of how you permute these one, two, threes, and so forth, that starting from the fifth order equation and on, no such expression can be found whose power is multivalued. Now, I do not want to, may I have the lights, please? I do not want you to even attempt at the moment to fully understand that. The point I'm trying to make is that by considerations of symmetry alone, of how certain expressions change or do not change under certain operations, one can draw certain conclusions. And that was, in fact, the motivation behind the study of such permutations and their compositions. Let me now jump enormously and show you how exactly the same permutations, exactly the same concept, can be applied in a vastly, infinitely far remote context of the marriage laws of primitive societies. Now, the story, by the way, of the deciphering of marriage laws of primitive society in itself a fantastic story because it was done by Levi Strauss from Collège de France with his collaborators without really knowing the language, as a matter of fact. And in many of the African and Polynesian and Australian tribes, they discovered a set of rules which govern, which govern which relatives are and which relatives are not permitted to marry. And as a matter of fact, and as a matter of fact, I, on the next slide, I have these rules written out, not all of them, but all the pertinent ones. May I have the next slide, please? Well, it turns out that every member of the tribe is assigned a marriage type, it's a kind of a symbol. And in only individuals of the same type are allowed to marry. By the way, that is not that is not how it is written in the books of the, of the tribes, because the, book, the rules are in terms of sec, to, mixed cousins can or cannot marry. A man is not allowed to marry his mother, but, and so forth. But that's how finally one comes to, to know what it is. The type of an individual is determined uniquely by, by his sex and by the type of the individual's parents. That means if you know the type of the parents, you know the offspring is male, you know his sex. And I mean, you know his type. And if, uh, and if the offspring is, is female, you also know his type. If two sets of parents are of different types, then their respective male offspring will be of different types. The same holds of female offspring. Whether a man is allowed to marry a female relative depends only on the manner in which they are related. And in particular, no man is allowed to marry his sister. By the way, there are no prohibitions in some society about marrying uh, about parents marrying their daughters or, 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 or sons marrying their mothers, remarkably enough. And some descendants of any two individuals must be allowed to marry. Now, these are verbal rules which have been deciphered from careful sociological investigations of many tribes. Now, the question is, can one in any way classify them in some rational way? And the remarkable thing is that, indeed, they can be classified very easily by the use of the concept of a permutation. If I have the light, I will, in a moment, just simply show you how, the, how, this, is, how this is done. Suppose there are four types only. And as a matter of fact, as far as I know, there are no societies with three types, and I think very few with five. And let me just take, so suppose that, again, I call the types one, two, three, four then in order to determine the law, the marriage laws, you must simply say, if this is the type of the parents, one, two, three, four, then you must give a rule how to determine the type of the male and the female offspring. And that's given by two permutations. Now, in fact, to take an actual example of a society known as the Carriera Society, which I'm ashamed to say I was unable to find out even where this particular tribe lives, there are the following two permutations. Three, four, one, two. And this is for the sun. And for the, in a moment, we will, in fact, explain what is going on. One, two, three, four. And this one is four, three, two, one, is for the daughter. Now, let us understand how one reads it. 
if the parents are of type one, the son will be of type three, but if the parents are of type one, the daughter will be of type, of type four, etc. Now, of course, you don't know it. That has to be deciphered. But now, suppose you knew that. Now, let us ask ourselves, can, for instance, mixed cousins marry? Is it allowed that a daughter of a son can marry the son of a daughter? But in some societies, mixed cousins are allowed to marry, but pure cousins are not allowed to marry in no other way around. Now, how do, we, how do we settle that? Well, as a matter of fact, a little bit of thought will convince you that all you have to do is to calculate SD and DS, the composition of the two permutations in one order and the other. And only if the results are identical will these mixed cousins be allowed to marry. If you will ask whether the pure cousins are allowed to marry, then you will have to calculate S. Well, no, oh, oh, that's a terrible faux pas, which only a mathematician can permit. No S squared. S times S. That means you compose S with itself. You compose D with itself. And for this particular society, it turns out that they're exactly the same. All of marriage laws, of all primitive tribes, can in fact be classified by giving such two permutations and telling exactly from the, deciphering from there which kind of relatives can, which relatives cannot, cannot marry. Now let us stop for one moment and think of the two contexts in which I mentioned to you the concepts. One was in connection with whether there exists an expression involving roots of an algebraic equation, and that brings shades of horror, no doubt, to your hearts. Whether there are such expressions whose cube or fourth power is or is not too valued. The other one, the other one is whether one can classify, whether one can classify strange verbal laws which govern marriage laws of primitive tribes. Now, in subject matter, you will agree with me they have clearly nothing in common. Yet the mathematical or the symbolic apparatus which is required to dwell into both of them are provided by exactly the same concepts and the same objects. And it is here that you begin to see, if you want to see with me, the beginning of the universality of the concept. I mean, the concept is on the side. To what it's applicable to is another story. And you see, I, I deliberately and dramatically presented to such vastly different concepts to show you how far the universality can go. The next stage of the game is what might be called the process of abstraction. Again, a most important, most vital part of any mathematical activity. Do we really need all that detailed information about the permutations? Do we really need all that? Perhaps in some of the things we're doing, we're not using all the details, but only certain general features. And once this is decided upon, then indeed you have arrived at a certain abstraction, because then you can operate with symbols without caring what these symbols are, provided they can be combined in a certain way. By the way, this is a particularly typical tendency of mathematics, a tendency so strong and so characteristic that it led um, Russell, Bertrand Russell, to say that mathematics is the only discipline which doesn't know what it's talking about, because it does not have to define its objects, provided it gives an ambiguous rule of telling you how to combine them, you see. Now, if you indeed pull out the most important, and of course, I am abbreviating many, many decades of struggle, you see, for you, but if you, if you pull out what are some of the essential things one uses either in the study of the algebraic equations or in the deciphering of the marriage laws, you come to the following four extremely simple rules. May I have the next slide? No, that is still the, that's the one. There are some objects 
which I call F, F, F0, F1, F2, F3, and I put I and J or something K because I don't know how many I have, which can be combined. For instance, for permutations, they can be combined by simply uh, composing them, correct? But the combination must have the following properties. If you combine two of them, you always get a member of the same class. That's automatic. Then if you combine two of them with a third one, you can do it in two different ways. You see the first one, and that's not associativity. Then there is a unique element which combined with any other element doesn't do anything. That's reminiscent of the multiplication by one. Multiplying by one doesn't do anything. Adding zero doesn't do anything. Now, each element has a unique inverse. That means one which, if combined with its, with its other element, you see, leads again to the identity. With permutations, it was, with permutations, it was uh, simply the inverse. You undo what one of them did. And then you can simply study without regard of what the Fs are. You can simply study what properties, what properties such systems can have. By the way, it's a wonderful example uh, because it's so simple, there are only four, three properties, really. Four, if you want to say that F, the two Fs combined, composed together, will always give you an F, showing the difference between natural sciences and mathematics. Because in natural sciences, chemistry, physics, biology especially, one strives to decipher, to, to find extremely simple properties of extremely complex objects. In mathematics, it's the reverse. You try to find complex properties of extremely simple objects. You create something of this sort, and then you spend all your life finding out what the properties are. Now, you see, these properties have been abstracted from permutations, from the study of permutations. Let me, however, show you an entirely different, a completely different set of objects and a completely different set of, and a, a completely different operation for which where these things are again completely satisfied. May I have the lights please for a moment? And that is, as a matter of fact, known as multiplication modulo P, but that's only a, a scary name for something extremely simple. First of all, you choose yourself a prime number. A prime number is a number which has only itself and one as a divisor. Seven is a very simple one. Some, no, not seven, 17 is the smallest arbitrary number. Whenever you say, name a number, they say 17, pick seven. Seven is a prime number because it has no divisors but itself and seven. And then take all the, all the integers less than seven. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Now I'm going to combine them as follows. I'll put two circle three, and the rule is the following. Multiply them. Well, that's so far easy, six. And that is indeed six. But if the result is larger than seven, then reduce it by as, by as many multiples of seven as you can to reach still a positive integer. For instance, four, circle five. Now, your inclination will say four times five, that's 20, correct? But 20 is larger than seven. And what's the largest multiple in seven that comes in is 14. So you, you take it away, and what's left is six again. That's a remarkable business, but two, four, circle five. What about five, circle six? Five times six is 30. But 30 is much larger than seven, in fact. I have now to subtract the largest multiple of seven that is still contained in it, and that's 28, if I'm not mistaken. And so you have, you get two. And so you have yourself a rule of combining numbers, correct? A little like multiplication, but not quite. It's a multiplication, except when it gets too difficult. It means when the result is too large, then you make it a little bit simpler for yourself and forget about all the multiples of seven. The next table, next slide, will show you a table, a table of multiplication. You can check it very easily. For instance, three times five. By the way, in this case, it doesn't matter in which order you combine, which is always a great simplification. Three times five is 15 uh, in ordinary multiplication. That's larger than seven. You must take away the multiples of seven, which, how many? 14, correct? What's left is one. That in particular means that three and five are inverses of each other, correct? 
because one multiplied by the, uh, uh, one combined with the other gives you one. Very good. Now, why even bother about such a thing? All right, let me again have the lights and I will show you why you will bother with such things. Because I will now do the following. Suppose I have, by the way, this such a set of objects with a operation of combining them so that you can perform the operations with the properties as stated is known as a group. And as a matter of fact, it has nothing to do, as Professor Lofsky assured me and I assured him, with Mary McCarthy's group. But that's called a group. Now suppose you have A naught, or make it A1, A2, A3, and you combine them all, say, up to, in this case, A6. And then do it again, keep on combining. But that's, repeat the whole thing. So simply write out the whole slew of your elements and do it once again. By the way, I don't think I have written it large enough, so let me repeat it. You go until you reach A6, and then you start again, and you go until A6. Now the question is, what is it? Well now, if you know it came from a group, then it's obvious what it is. It must be one. Why? Because every element has an inverse, correct? Remember, one and only one inverse. So whenever you get to A1, then in the second batch, you rapidly look through and find his inverse and combine it with him. Remember, here the order doesn't matter, so I can do, as soon as I found him, I will cancel him, correct? That's one. Then I take A2, and I, equal rapidity, I try to find the one that cancels him, and again I get him, and so I get one times one times one times, I mean one combined with one combined with one combined, and I get one. Consequently, the product of all these things must be such an element that when combined with itself gives me one. Now, one such element you know, and that's one, because one combined with one is one. Let me have again the same slide, and then we'll try to find the other one. So in the table of multiplication, I'll try, on the main diagonal, I'll try to find one. Because remember, I want a number combined with itself is one. In other words, in this strange arithmetic, or algebra, I'm trying to take the square root of one. And there is one right there, you see? And if you look, there's also one here, six combined with six. That's 36, and 36 is very much larger than seven. In fact, the multiple of seven that comes in there is 35, and you subtract them away, and you get yourself the one. One, time, it's, it's this, more or less abstract statement is equivalent to a purely arithmetical one or number theoretic one, which has one times two times etc. Multiplied until you get p minus one, the one less than the prime. Then if you add to it one, then the result will always be divisible by p. Let's try it. If p is five, five minus one is four. 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 is 24, plus 1 is 25, eminently divisible by 5. Let's try 7. Se uh, 7 one, less 1 is 6. 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 is 720. 720 plus 1 is 721, and I assure you it's divisible by 7. In fact, the result is 103. And in fact, in general, no matter what this prime number is, this is going to be divisible by, by P, and that, in fact, is an old theorem it's proved by, by an Englishman in 18th century, I believe, or maybe late 17th century, and it's almost all textbooks on number theory known as Wilson's theorem. Wilson's theorem, which refers to integers, ordinary indivisibility, comes in the most natural way if you study the simple concept of the same group that came out in the marriage laws of primitive societies, and also in the study of algebraic equations. Last example will really be a game, almost, although it's a very serious ob object, and we're going to do something with the so-called theory of braids. And I mean braids, the kind of one, braids. And we'll again show how by 
properly um, employing concept of a group, one can solve a certain problem. And I'll again be the last of my illustrations, and then I can finally summarize and give you a certain number of general points of, if not truth, then perhaps wisdom or vice versa. Now let me first of all define my app, and the first slide will uh, be, will explain what the pro at least will start the pro what the problem is. Now you have what I call a weaving configuration. That consists of two, imagine the line L1 and line L2 as being made of wood. And P1, P2, P3, and P4 as being pegs. And Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 also as being pegs. But they are movable along the wooden board, except you cannot interpenetrate them. I mean, you can only move them, but you, they can never, you can't exchange Q4 and Q3. That is not allowed. They are then connected with flexible strings, which you can imagine as rubber, uh, rubber bands. Every point on the top is connected with one and only one point on the bottom. For instance, P1 is with Q3, P2 with Q1, P3 with Q4, and uh, uh, I, I guess that is, that is all, and P2 with Q1. And moreover, I can do one over it or under it, correct? In this case, the, 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 the line connecting P3, Q4 is above. Whenever it's the broken means being below the one which is unbroken, correct? I'll call this a weaving configuration. And by the way, notice that I don't really, I deliberately drew these lines a little bit wavy uh, because I don't really care. You can be rather sloppy because you don't have to stretch them out and for them to be straight. You can move, move them around, stretch them out, even move the pegs, provided you don't tear anything. You see, you, you cannot tear out a peg and place it here. You can move it. Or you cannot, for if, if one of these rubber bands is above another, then that is forever, because the only way I get under is to cut it. So in other words, you can only deform such a weaving configuration in a continuous way without tearing, okay? And then you see all of them, they, they may look quite different, but all which can be obtained by such operation belong to the same pattern, because as if you got a book and they gave you a weaving pattern and say, connect P1 with Q3, but be sure to have it over the one connecting P2, Q1, etc. And from there on, you can be sloppy. So the weaving pattern, or a braid as it's called, is really something which all such things have in common, and they're the same because they can be deformed in the, without tearing, without breaking one into another. And the question now is, can I classify them all? Given two such patterns, can I say, are they the same or aren't they the same? Now, what does it mean? That means if I give you two such configurations and I ask you, are they or aren't they the same, that means can I, by without tearing, without breaking, transform one into another? Now, because I've only used four pegs, almost everybody will do it very quickly. But if I use 10,000, and then it will be a rather tangled mess, and by the way, the problem is not really particularly important or practical, but, so, but the question is, can one solve it, you see? Now, maybe a human can, but suppose the problem is the following. Suppose you don't want to do it yourself. You want a computer to do it. A computer has to be then instructed. Do this, 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 and this, and then make your decision. He can't say, I feel that they're the same or I feel it in my bones, or I have an intuition. A computer has no such thing. So you must find out now, is there a rule whereby it can be done? And remarkably enough, again, the concept of the group leads you to a symbolic description of this situation, which leads to such a thing. In order to do that, to show you how this is done, I would like to have the second slide, and I'll show you how one composes patterns. Now you see? Uh, could we move it slightly to the right? Slightly to the right. Well, it doesn't matter. Now, I have a pattern A. The only reason why I was going to move it because one says A, the other says B. Expressed right there, P on the top. Then I have a pattern B, which is this one. And now I combine them as follows. That's the operation of combination. No, if I only knew how to do it. Here it is. You move L2, 
the lower one to coincide with the upper one. So Q1 becomes this one, Q2 becomes this one, Q3 becomes this one, Q4 becomes this one. Then you remove L2 and L1 prime and connect them so that now the, the line going from P2 to Q1 will join with this line right here. And the line going from P1 to Q2 will join with this one here and so forth. Then after the whole thing is over, you see, what, what, is, what remains is the combined pattern which I call A circle B. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't take very much imagination to see what happens because when I do that, you see, then the P2Q1, this one, can now be simply folded over the other one and these two remain completely uh, uh, un unbraided, if you wish, while these two now, you see, because this one doesn't do really anything, becomes this one. So this braid or this weaving pattern, this weaving configuration is simply a combination of these. Now, a little bit of thought will show you as the next line will, slide will indicate, that you can, there are four, fundam, four, six really, three, six fundamental braids. There is this one, there is this one, there is this one, and then there are inverses. And the inverse is exactly the same braid as here, except where that one was up, the other one is down. Now, use your imagination, if you combine A1 with A1, I call it minus one, meaning, meaning inverse, it's perhaps too, uh, it's, it's too misleading perhaps to call it A minus one, but if I do that, then you see what you get is a completely straight braid. In fact, the straight braid is on the next slide. May I, and here it is, and that's the identity braid. If you combine this one with any other braid, you don't change anything at all. Now, how, given a braid, or giving either a weaving, a weaving configuration, how do I decompose it into, how do I write it now symbolically? May I have the next one, the next slide? And that's the, you see, here is one, and I'll show you how it is done. If you simply think of this line being cut across, then the top one gives you two of these fundamental braids. I had two slides ago, and so is the bottom one. In fact, if you, this one is A1, and this one is A3, and this one, as a matter of fact, I think is uh, A1, A3, and this is A2 minus, uh, and I think that's the inverse of A2. May I go back two slides, please? You see, uh, it's this one. No, uh, uh, the, the next slide, please, the next one. No, uh, I, the ones where I had the, um, that's the one, you see. I think it's this one and this one followed by the inverse of this one. Now, again, a little bit, thank you, a little bit of thought will convince you that every weaving pattern can then be written in terms of the A's and, the, and these. And, and, these. You see. and then, as a matter of fact, the problem for a computer no longer becomes a problem of moving around. All the geometry is gone, and you have coded in. You have coded in. You wrote a code, a sim you, you invented the symbol for writing out a braid, and then all the computer has to do is to find out how, for instance, the only rule is that A1 combined with A1, with, a, with this and this combined together give you unity, this and this give you, give you the identity braid, this and this give you and the braid, and also A1 and A3 can be combined in either order without changing the result, while A1 and A2 gives you a different result if A2 is combined with A1. With these rules, you can leave the job to the computer. The computer will simply write a symbol, symbol for one and for the other, and ultimately, in a finite time, as a perfectly well-defined algorithm, it will tell you whether the braids are or are not the same. May I have the lights, please? Now. Those are the examples. And I think the examples illustrate what I would like to emphasize, namely the universality of this particular concept. Because finally, the concept was a very simple one. It was, we had objects. By the way, the last group for the braid uh, was not a finite one. It's actually one which contains infinitely many elements, but that doesn't really matter. You you know, there's, a, there's certain objects, 
a rule of combining them and certain very simple operations on them. This in it already provides you with a framework which is sufficiently general and sufficiently, I would say, profound to be able to handle vastly different problems from the theory of algebraic equations through marriage laws of primitive societies to such topological problems because the question really whether two braid, two weaving configurations are around the same is a question which is concerned as part of mathematics known as topology, whether by continuous deformations one can be put into, into another. Now, several questions might arise. One, where there are other, applica where there are other applications? Indeed, there are. So one of the simplest ones is in geometry. When you think of a square, for instance, and that will be the last example, and then I can stick to more or less general statements. If you take a square, the ordinary square, except I'm going to emphasize its vertices, and I'm going to call them one, two, three, four. You can ask under what transformations does the square remain the same? Well, it's very easy. It certainly go remains the same if you rotate it by 90 degrees. It also remains the same if you rotate it by 180 degrees and by 270 degrees. It remains the same if you reflect it in this line. It remains the same if you reflect it in this line. And finally, it remains the same if you reflect it in the diagonal. As a matter of fact, those are all the fundamental ones. And if you combine any two of these, you again got, get one of them, you see. And as a matter of fact, they can be written also as permutations. For instance, the transformation of reflecting in the x-axis simply sends one into two, two into one, four into three, three into four. Now, consequently, one could almost think of the square as being described by those transformations which leave it alone. Now, but notice, by the way, there's an enormous abstraction involved here, or at least a very profound one, because I have taken away the object and replaced it by a set of transformations which leave it alone. Now, this idea is one of the most fruitful ones in science. It permeates a great deal of modern physics, for instance. With that, it will be impossible to even give you in a short lecture uh, without going into really technical details to give you any really clear idea how it is done, by the fact that certain forces, as I say, hold an atom together, are, have certain symmetry, do not change under the action of certain transformations, have direct, immediate applications as the kind of spectra these atoms are going to produce. The idea that from symmetry or from the study of transformations which do not change a certain object. From the study that one can derive something about the object itself is certainly a rate with one of the most remarkably fruitful and promising, it's still highly, uh, uh, conclusions are still being drawn from it, of all of modern science. Now, you might say, how does one know whether a concept has this universality. As a matter of fact, I deliberately chose the examples to oscillate between puzzle and something serious. The braids is a puzzle, as a matter of fact, although very near to this puzzle, a similar problem for nuts, which, is a more, which can also be stated in similar terms of certain groups, is still unsolved. Some of them are puzzles. Well, algebraic equations, perhaps you might say, are puzzles also, but at least there are sufficiently serious puzzles to be punished by them in school. Spectra of atoms, well, maybe on some grounds you might say they're more serious. But anyway, you have the whole gamut. Certain marriage laws of primitive societies are, for those who are about to be married, nobody knows. Many of the mathematical concepts have originated in what you might call idle curiosity or searching for solving a puzzle and so forth. There is something almost like a natural selection. Those concepts which survive 100 years have a certain aura of universality. Those which don't have the universality 
do not survive. Several years ago, or at least don't survive so well, several years ago, Professor Wigner of Princeton gave a lecture uh, at the Courant Institute of Analytical Sciences, I think the first Courant lecture, on the title of On the Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in Natural Sciences. And he wondered in a very charming way as to why concepts which the mathematician invents and plays for the, because of their beauty, their elegance, their appeal, why these very concepts, like the group, as a matter of fact, also ultimately become the concepts which are of such importance in describing the mysteries of nature. Well, there is no uh, easy answer. And, say, and more, uh, as the, same, the same way as there is no answer to whether a concept which someone invents today will achieve the universality of the concept of a group. All of us who have invented something wish it were so. Whether that is so will be seen, unfortunately, long after we will not be able to either enjoy our victory or suffer in our, in our defeat. But the, the point remains that certain concepts, because of their because of the process of abstraction, and because also they were born in the service of a difficult problem, somehow managed to achieve what might be called the, univers the, the universality. And I wish if, if I could have conveyed in this admittedly brief, quick, and only sem semi-technical lecture, the idea that the same concept the same fundamental general rules, which are in fact abstract in their, in, in their setup, can be applied in vastly different concrete context. That this is the earmark of the real universality and that it is on, of such concept that man is made of, then I think the evening will have been worth suffering for all of us. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.